Greetings, Starfighters. Uh, before we get into it, let me just go ahead and say right now that there is not going to be any Channel Awesome drama in this video like there was in my last one. So for the six of you that are still watching, welcome to Season 2 of Shameless Cash Grab using the Life's a Beach set from Mill Creek this time, cashing in on the Baywatch movie from last year. And our first movie, and um, yeah, I I'm aware that the cover art for this DVD, it's, um, well, it is, se it is, it is, it's sexist, I'll just go ahead and say that. I'm aware of that. If I went into the reasons why it's sexist, for those of you who might not understand, we'd be here all day. So I'm just going to go ahead and go into what our first movie for this season is going to be. And it is going to be 1984's Hard Bodies. I've actually heard of this one. This is supposed to be some of those classic 80s comedies, but I've actually never seen it. I know that my dad liked this movie, but then again, he liked Porky's. I never cared for that one either. So who knows? You know, come to think of it, looking at all these descriptions on the back, there's a lot of sex comedies on this. I'm not really a fan of sex comedies. I may have made a terrible mistake. All right, so now I have watched the 1984 comedy Hard Bodies. But before I go into it, let me just uh, lay out real quick some thoughts I have about how Season 2 is going to be different from Season 1 of Shameless Cash Grab. Uh, the most obvious thing, of course, is there's no Stranger Things similarity section of the review. Uh, but there's not going to be a Baywatch similarities section either. I doubt anybody's going to be too disappointed, though, because, I mean, let's face it, Baywatch is not that deep. Um, no pun intended, because it takes place in the ocean. <clears throat> Uh, another thing I'm planning to do with Season 2 here is have the uh, plot summaries I give at the start be a little bit more in-depth, so that I don't just spend the entirety of the show basically reciting what happens in the movie. I mean, I've already been striving since I started this to be not like the nostalgia critic and you know in the wake of in the wake of change the channel that is even more important for me to not be like him yeah if you saw my last video you kind of understand that uh that whole thing had a bit of an effect on me but um of course this means i'm going to have to look for sources besides wikipedia and imdb for plot summaries but uh, for this movie, since the plot is actually fairly simple, I went ahead and went with one of the ones they had on IMDb anyway. Not the main one. They actually have um, a couple of user-submitted plot summaries, and this one, I figure, covered it pretty well. So I'm going to go ahead and give you that, and then give my thoughts about the movie with some additional random thoughts that I couldn't really work into the main th like thrust of my script, and then the final verdict. The final verdict, of course, being a carryover from the last season. So, you know, some things are going to be the same. Also, pictures. And, boy howdy. It, yeah, in a way, I'm actually lucky that my channel isn't monetized right now, because I do not see this episode being tagged as advertiser-friendly. A lot of nudity in this movie. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump into the plot summary courtesy of IMDb. Again, future episodes, I'll start looking for other sources so I can make the plot summary a bit more in-depth than the ones I would usually post for uh, Season 1. Hunter, Rounder, and Ashby are middle-aged businessmen friends who decide that they have focused on work for most of their adult lives and now need to reward themselves by renting a nice beach house in Southern California where they plan to pick up the nubile young women, I, I didn't write that phrase, half their ages that populate the beach. They find that although they have the money, they don't have all else that goes al I should have 
read this before. I copied and pasted it. They they don't have anything else that goes along with impressing the girls. No, that doesn't really work either. Fuck it, moving on. They meet Scotty Palmer, a young man around who the girls seem to flock to. Scotty implies that they too can have all these young women if they just know how to go about it. You probably just heard me cringe there. As such, the men propose that he teach them in return for a $600 fee and he's staying with them in their nice house. What they are unaware of is that Scotty needs them as much as they need him, as he has just been evicted from his rundown pigsty of an apartment for being three months behind in rent. Scotty is able to parlay this work into managing a girl band, which the promoter wants to partner with the whole hard body movement, the nickname given to the perfectly sculpted bodies on the beach. But in the process, Scotty brings out the inner monster of some of his students, which threatens not only his job with them, but his relationship with his girlfriend, Christy. I was dreading watching this movie, to be honest. I mean, now judging from that plot summary, you can probably guess why. I mentioned in the video portion of this episode that I'm not a fan of sex comedies, and this movie has done little to improve that disposition. Except insofar as some of the ones I've seen before look better now by comparison. To say this movie handles women about as well as H.P. Lovecraft handles dialogue would be an understatement. Not that the men are really any better, though. I guess I can give the movie that much. It's more misanthropic than misogynistic. Kind of like Michael Bay. Well, no, that's actually not fair to Michael Bay. He doesn't really hide the fact that he doesn't think much of his male characters, either. This movie wants us to view the main character as charming and likable. It just fails at it. Or, I guess at least it does to a progressive watching this in 2018. This movie's heroes, uh, Scotty and the older folks, engage in what I could describe as proto-pickup artistry, or honestly, people who study the manosphere more in depth than I can bring myself to because I don't have that strong a stomach, would probably just call it straight-up pickup artistry, but... You know, you know, that kind of thing would be annoying to see any day, but I made the unfortunate mistake of deciding to watch this movie the same day I was getting dogpiled by a bunch of fucking incels. Sticking to the movie, uh, though we see early on in the film that our main protagonist has a girlfriend, he really easily slides into lying to impress other women. Oh, but he doesn't sleep with them, so I guess it's okay. Uh, women who are, I might add, portrayed as vapid bimbos who love expensive cars. I shouldn't be shocked. And I'm not. And this is all before he engages in victim-blaming during his big damn hero moment in the second half. But, you know, I'm not going to go too much into that because it would make me uncomfortable. See, Hard Bodies is such a cringy movie that I had to pause it every few minutes or so just so I could take a deep breath. Were I not doing it for this show, I would not have even bothered finishing it. And the thing of it is, this isn't even the worst movie I've ever seen. It's not even the most sexist, not overtly anyway, but it certainly feels more gross than the others, if that makes any sense. Other movies I've seen that have problems with women have been much more overt in their sexism, so it's out there and easier to deal with. You can just call it sexist and call it a day. Here, it's the kind of sexism that requires a lot of multisyllabic words to properly describe, and the thing is, it's something more fitting for a show where discussions of feminism and consent and the male gaze are the main point of the series. I'm just here to talk about multi-movie cash sets. Anyway, <laughs> I had to get in one anyway in or it wouldn't be my show, would it? At about the halfway mark, you know, about two hours into an 87-minute movie, the girlfriend character, the aforementioned Christy, um, although they only say her name once and she disappears from the movie for about 20 minutes at one point, so it was easy for me to forget her name, finally calls Scotty out on his bullshit. This scene frustrates me because she is not wrong. Stick with me here. She's not wrong. A at all. If anything, she understates it. But the problem is, is that it is a complete 180 from how she'd been portrayed the rest of her time in the movie up to that point. So while I agree completely with her snark about Scotty and the older men he's been helping out, it still fails because it doesn't happen organically. One minute she's the air quotes cool girl, and the next she's practically Lindy West. 
Which would be fine. I, again, I agree with everything that Christie said in that scene. I can't emphasize that enough, but... Okay, I'm starting to repeat myself. I, I've noticed that I tend to repeat myself a lot when I really hate a movie, and I really hate this movie. <sighs> yeah, I will say this for hard bodies, though. At least I don't feel like any of the actors were wasted in their parts. Nobody here feels like they were too good for this movie. So in that sense, Hard Bodies is not as bad as My Mom's a Werewolf, though that's a case of damning with faint praise. Also, I can see why people in the 1980s might have actually found this stupid movie funny, whereas I'm pretty sure My Mom's a Werewolf would have been a failure in any decade. This is about as generous as I can be with Hard Bodies. I hope you appreciated that. Well, okay, I did at least get some mild amusement out of the earlier montages of Hunter, Rounder, and Ashby, you know. God, they actually called the fat guy Rounder. Oh, I, I don't. Do I? Do I even need to say what's wrong with that? As I was saying, I did get some mild amusement out of the montages earlier in the movie of them completely failing to pick up women. Would have been nice to see them getting slapped, ignored, or insulted by the women they were trying to pick up for the whole movie, but alas. And that time, the odious comic sidekick character, who they called Rag, and oh god, I just got it, he was a redhead, so that probably is a reference to Raggedy Andy. Oh god, I... This, this is the Batman v Superman of 80s sex comedies. The more I think about it, the more reasons I find to hate it. Okay, as, as I was saying, that time he got elbowed in the face when he tried to grope Christie's friend, that got an actual laugh out of me. It kind of gets undermined by the fact that the two of them sleep together at the end of the movie, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, fuck it. I will take the... This is supposed to be a comedy. I will take the laughs where I can get them. And as bad as it is... I, I can't believe I'm actually saying this. I got more laughs out of Hard Bodies than I did out of My Mom's a Werewolf. Even though I kind of hate Hard Bodies more. How does that even happen? But that that laugh with the... Uh, with Rag getting elbowed and the mild amusement from the failure montage are really the only laughs until the last ten minutes, you know, when the movie finally remembers that it's supposed to be a comedy. I'm starting to think that those last ten minutes are the only reason this movie became a cult hit. Because, you know, okay, I'll admit it, I actually kind of liked the last ten minutes. Mostly. Okay, congratulations, Hard Bodies. You just managed to clear the bar. You are better than my mom's a werewolf, but just barely. Some additional random thoughts I had while watching this movie? The opening montage wouldn't be out of place on an episode of Baywatch, though frankly Baywatch had better music. If I had a Baywatch similarities section, this would, the montage would definitely go in there. Less than three minutes of the movie, we already have nudity. That's got to be a record, even for an 80s sex comedy. And I think this may be the first time I have ever seen a waterbed that also managed to be a fire hazard. It makes sense in context. Final verdict. Hard body sucks. This movie sucks. Not even the legit laughs. Like, honest-to-goodness laughs I got in the last ten minutes made it worth it. It is incredibly sexist. I'm, I'm grateful that we don't have an actual rape scene in the movie, although we do get an attempted one, which is... Yikes. And of course, casual homophobia, including from the hero. But I guess that's to be expected from 80s movies. Hell, even some of the good ones... So, even some of the good movies of the 80s had casual homophobia in them, unfortunately. Uh, apparently, um, looking at the cast list, Kane Hodder probably best known for playing Jason Voorhees in, like, I think, six of the eleven... Yeah, yeah, six... Sorry, no, six of the ten mainline Friday the 13th movies, plus the reboot. Unfortunately, because I'm so used to seeing him in the hockey mask, I don't think I spotted him in there. Given the year this came out, this must have been a pretty early role for him. I think this was pre-Jason Voorhees. We all gotta start somewhere, I guess. But speaking of starts, this movie is a bad start to the Life's a Beach set. I may have liked Pulse less after giving it more thought, 
But at least it was a better start to the Strange Things set than this movie is to Life's a Beach. Is this a harbinger of things to come? I mean, I already know what I'm getting with Hard Ticket to Hawaii because I saw Allison Pregler's review of it, but the rest of these movies? Yikes. Okay, no, no. Alright, stop being so negative, Oracle. Come on. There's plenty of room for this set to get better. Like, maybe the next movie won't be so hard to sit th through. Oh, god damn it. <laughs>